Let me uh, read to us out of Timothy. We start a new sermon series today uh, based on the summer games. And Paul has given Timothy some pieces of advice, some qualifications, and then he says this. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourselves to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. This is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. The word of God for the people of God, Thanks be to God. When it was first announced back in 2013, like civic boosters everywhere, the organizers were absolutely jubilant. They were looking forward to what they thought would be a PR bonanza and a lot of money. But then, as so very often seems to happen, things started going a bit sideways. The design for the main stadium had to be tossed after it was widely ridiculed for looking like an oversized bicycle helmet, uh, maybe a galactic spaceship, or even worse, one person said, like a turtle waiting for Japan to sink so that it can swim away. The logo for the games likewise had to be replaced when it was discovered that it was plagiarism, a ripoff of a theater in Belgium. The president of the local organizing committee had to step down after he publicly said, women talk too much in board meetings. (laughs) And then, of course, the pandemic postponed the whole event by a year, threatened to cancel it altogether. None of that was as bad, however, as the fact that the budget originally projected to be $7.5 billion quickly ballooned like every Olympic game budget has since 1960. The cost of the games is estimated now to be as high as $26 billion. And now with just 12 days left to go into the opening on the 23rd, it's been announced that due to a resurgence in the uh, uh, COVID-19 in in Japan, that there will be absolutely no spectators in the stands. That will end up costing another $800 from lost sales of tickets. Still, the athletes have kept preparing, an extra year even. It's common for Olympic athletes to spend eight years training in a sport before even making any any kind of a national team. A study that came out before some games a few years ago said some athletes put in 10,000 hours of practice before the games. All of that so that you and I can watch the glories of synchronized swimming, race walking, and the pommel horse, which has been described as bright dancing for the suburbs. (laughs) Now, to be sure, those are better than some of the really odd summer games uh, which which the games used to have, such as live pigeon (laughs) pigeon shooting, until they weren't anymore, I guess, swimming obstacle races, which contestants had to swim to a pole, climb climb, climb up the pole, then back down, swim some more, clabber over two boats, and then under two more before swimming to reach the finish line. Solo synchronized swimming. Go figure that. And even distance plunging last held in 1904. uh, Athletes would would dive into a pool, uh, remain motionless on the bottom of it for 60 seconds or as long as they could, before bobbing to the top to see who could bob the farthest. Long jump with swimming kind of thing. 
but even without odd sports, even without spectators. What's safe to say is that nobody goes to the Olympics, participates in any competitive sport for that matter, who hasn't first learned the importance of training. I want to suggest to you this morning it's the same when it comes to the Christian faith. The truth is we have been called to exercise that as well. Specifically to train ourselves to be godly. And so as we begin this sermon series focusing on the summer games of life, training is the place where we ought to start as well. See, in in writing to his his young protege Timothy, St. Paul tells him here in chapter 4 to have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Bebelos, gradios, mythos. Bebelos refers to a threshold over which you uh, must step in order to enter a building. Uh, sometimes, though, in this case, uh, an, an, an inappropriate threshold, one that, that you shouldn't be going over, something which is profane, in fact. Um, gradios means something that is characteristic of old women, and mythos means myth, false accounts. Don't have anything to do with these godless myths and old wives' tales, Paul says. But instead, Timothy should train himself, and literally, gym not they, get our words gym, gymnasium, gymnastics from it. You should train yourself, literally, gymnasize yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, Paul says, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Now it strikes me that if the good apostle were here this morning with us, he would probably say the same thing to you and me as well. For even within the church today, we've fallen for all kinds of untruths. We've overlooked the trustworthy sayings that, that actually matter. We've we've tied our wagon to the culture drawing from its collective wisdom or lack thereof rather than putting our hope into the living God who is the savior of all, especially of those who believe, as verse 10 so intriguingly puts it. We swallowed whole, for instance, uh, the pernicious idea that truth need not be absolute or universal or even true anymore. It's all simply relative you and me individually. So such things as abortion may be wrong for me or for some Catholics, but not for you or for other Catholics. <laughs> Lying may be wrong at times, but fairly necessary in some circumstances. Cheating on your spouse may be sinful, but it, not if it's simply a case of having married wrong. What did the old song tell us? Oh, it's sad to belong to someone else when the right one comes along. Than that drivel. Just plain wrong. Truly, some truths are meant for everyone. Gravity, for instance, would seem to be an equal opportunity adversary of anybody who tries to rise up and not eventually fall down. You don't even have to believe in it for it to be true, do you? Just, just hold something out, drop it. You get a demonstration of it every single time. The fact that we all grow old. It's not really a negotiable truth either, is it? All the bow tots and facelifts and tummy tots notwithstanding. You can't change it. You can only disguise it. And you can't even do that all that well unless you are fabulously wealthy or Marie Osmond with a new Nutrisystem plan. But the fact is, we all grow older every day whether we want to or not. That's not a tale spun by old wives. That's a reality (laughs) that actually creates old wives and old husbands too. Likewise, the the notion that, that, that moral truths are somehow less absolute than physical ones is just plain wrong. Again, not just wrong for me, but wrong all the time, everywhere, for everyone. Christianity reminds us godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come, as Paul said. So how might we train ourselves up spiritually? Let me suggest that we take a cue 
from the playbooks of those athletes who will be competing in Japan this month. First of all, world-class athletes follow what we would call a well-rounded training regimen. That is to say, they figured out that varying up their training can help improve things like their strength, their endurance, their speed, agility, irrespective of the particular sport that they're working in. It's called cross-training. And my goodness, friends, even a first-year seminarian, right, Amy? Is that any? Even a first-year seminarian ought to be able to make some sort of sermon reference out of this cross-training. Cross-training not only increases the overall fitness of athletes, it also decreases the risk of overuse injuries or strains. Frequent runners can cut down uh, on their repetitive stress on their knees by spending one day a week weightlifting instead of running. That means for Christians, we too need to change up our routines from time to time so our spiritual practices don't become simply rote or perfunctory. Our devotionals don't become deadly dull to us. Yeah, we should pray every day. There are all different kinds of prayer, all different formats of prayer, all different expressions of prayer. We should read the scriptures, but we can, we can alternate between sections of the Bible, different genres within the Bible. And from time to time, we really ought to do a, a serious self-assessment of our spiritual lives. Every time I go into my gym, someone asks me if I want a personal trainer. I'm beginning to take offense at this. Would you like someone who can help you assess what you're doing, sir? Apparently, I'm not doing it right. Secondly, however, Olympic athletes don't skimp on their sleep. One sports performance specialist, Dr. Dennis Ebner of Ohio State Medical School, has put it, of all the recovery techniques, proper sleep is undoubtedly the most cost-effective strategy for athletes because during the sleep cycle, your body is busy regenerating and repairing muscle tissue. And if you don't get enough sleep, your body will instead, uh, instead release the stress hormone cortisol and limit your own natural human growth hormone. Likewise, lack of sleep alters your mental performance, your reaction time, and your judgment. All of which means that we need to balance out our work with regular times of rest. In a like way, time off is non-negotiable. In God's original plan, in fact, that was built into the fabric of creation. It's called the Sabbath. I love what is almost the ubiquitous greeting in Israel among, and among Jews on Friday before the weekend begins. People wish each other a Shabbat Shalom, a peaceful Sabbath. Now, technically, you shouldn't say it on other days. You probably should never say it to giraffes. I don't know. There is a mitzvah that says to remember the Sabbath day, the Shabbat day, every day of the week, though. But the idea is that life with all of its hustle and bustle should stop at some point. Remembering the Sabbath is not just a slogan. It's a commandment, dear friends, one of the big ten. So we likewise ought to put aside our cell phones, shouldn't we? not read our emails, set aside time for renewal and rest regularly. Don't go 24-7. Set aside time for Sabbath. Then third, despite the fact that they burn hundreds, thousands of calories every day, Olympic athletes don't just eat, eat anything they want. They, they don't eat junk food, for instance. They follow a nutrition and healthy eating regimen. Lots of fruits, lots of veggies, lots of protein. And I suggest to you in a similar fashion that training ourselves to be godly means skipping the junk food that goes into our minds and into our hearts. The inappropriate jokes, the, the cutting remarks, the unkind judgments, the cynical view of everything. That it means adopting a healthy spiritual diet 
focused around doing good for others. Putting ourselves in positive places. Uh, thinking on the things that are good and beautiful and noble and lovely. And most of all, reading God's word. How interesting it is to me <clears throat> that the Bible uses imagery about actually eating God's word. In the Old Testament, Ezekiel is called to be a prophet. He sees a scroll unrolled before him and is told, Son of man, eat what is before you. Eat this scroll and then go and speak to the people of Israel. And so he does and it tastes as sweet as honey in his mouth. <clears throat> Similarly, in the last book of the New Testament, St. John too encounters a mighty angel with a scroll and he, he too is told to eat it and it too tastes as sweet as honey in his mouth. The point in both instances is that to devour something is to receive it into your own being. To consume it is to put it in you. And you and I, we should be devouring the word of God, sisters and brothers. All the, all the things churches do sometimes, and we're, we're, we're a busy place here. We haven't really stopped during the pandemic. I gotta tell you that all the things we do, nothing is as important as putting the word of God into us. Absolutely nothing. We can have, you know, I, I'm, I'm an advantage as a pastor here because I, ha I have Beth McConnell. It, 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 I mean, if she plays, y'all don't care what I say. Okay. You've gotten your money's worth. Okay, it's, it's all good. But we have to somehow figure out how do we get how do we get the word of God into us? Because that's the only way that we will ever grow. With all the misinformation that marks our culture this morning, only the word of God stands secure. And so we need a regular diet plan centered around it. How did Jesus teach us how to pray? Give us this day our daily bread. Daily bread. Not weekly, one hour on Sundays, bread, daily. And then fourth, every Olympic athlete spends time perfecting a recovery plan. I suspect Coach Harris knows about recovery plans. Physically, there's a number of them from basic stretching to soft tissue massage to thermotherapy to cryotherapy, even just a hot bath. But at the root of them all is the understanding that sometimes, sometimes your training is going to go astray. And dear friends, sometimes our spiritual fervor is likewise going to fail. And our resolve not to sin is going to weaken. When it does, we have a spiritual recovery plan too. St. John told us about it. In his first letter, chapter 2, he wrote, My dear children, it's a very tender salutation, mia technia in Greek. I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is atoning sacrifice for our sins, not for ours only, but sins of the whole world. In the same fashion, James, the earthly brother of Jesus, once said, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. That's why it is important, it is vital to stay connected to other people in the faith. To have a community around you, to be accountable to somebody else, to be in a small group, to have someone who can call you on things. Someone who can ask you as the early Methodists, ask each other, how fair is your soul? How is it with you and Jesus this week? The most pernicious impact of the pandemic has been that it separated all of us at a time when we most needed each other in our lives. It continues to do so today. Even in the church, as some of our missing members and, and empty pews so poignantly proclaim. But as Ecclesiastes 4 tells us, two are better than one. If, if either one of them falls down, one can help the other one up. Or to put it another way, we are each other's recovery plans. 
And if we do these four things, if we learn how to cross-train, observe times of rest and renewal, Shabbat, if we feed our spiritual lives with the healthy food of the scriptures, if we surround ourselves with others who can help us back up when we fall down, then we too will be ready not just for the summer games, we'll be ready for the game of life when it comes to following Jesus. Let's go back for a moment to those empty stands in Tokyo. The first time the Olympics were scheduled to take place in Tokyo was 1940. They didn't happen then either. Because when the second Sino Japanese war between China and, and, and Japan broke out in 1937, a prelude to World War II. The Japanese government, faced with an impending boycott by many nations because of their hostility and aggression, announced they were dropping the games, forfeiting their, their spot. The stadium that they had built went unused until 1964, when the games came to Asia for the first time. The 1940 games were then rescheduled for Helsinki, Finland, but by that time came along, the war was already underway in Europe too, and so those games had to be canceled. But in August 1940, prisoners of war at German Stalag 13A near Nuremberg held their own do-it-yourself international POW Olympic Games. They had to do it in secret because the penalties for disobeying or even disrespecting the Germans who were in charge of the camp, a camp that was not for officers but for enlisted men, penalties were severe ones. But they managed to somehow hold an opening ceremony complete with a flag featuring the Olympic rings drawn in crayon made from a Polish prisoner's shirt and bed sheets. That flag was later smuggled out, by the way. It's displayed in the Museum of Sports and Tourism in Warsaw. They also drew up banners for the countries represented in that prisoner of war camp, Belgium, France, England, Poland, Norway, Russia, and the Netherlands. They drew them on their prisoner shirts. They swore an oath in the name of all the sportsmen whose stadiums are fenced with barbed wire. The appeal did was understood. You, you don't need spectators in order to do your best. You just need to do your best. Because in the end, we're, we're all called not to accept glory from each other, but to seek the glory that comes from the only God, John tells us. We might call him the audience of one everywhere in life, whether it's in a stadium that's empty or one that is full of fans, it is God's pleasure we should be pursuing above all else. That doesn't mean we're trying to earn his applause or his favor by being successful in our competition or by winning. It doesn't mean that we don't care about what others may think about us or that somehow we are uh, 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 just, just free from their criticisms, criticisms oblivious to them does mean that we keep those criticisms in their proper place. We allow God's kingdom values to define us, not the values of this world. We allow God to tell us who we are, not the world. Because ultimately, you see, there's only one, there's only one whose opinion about us really matters. We live for that audience of one. How's your training going this morning, friends. Not your gym routine. Your spiritual training. Let me ask it a different way. Are you a more godly person today than you used to be? Are you closer to Christ this morning than you were five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago, fifty years ago? Are you more devoted to God and his word than you've ever been? If not, maybe you need to make a reassessment 
of your spiritual training and routine. It's been said that just 30 minutes a day of moderate exercise can lower your blood pressure by 15 points with all kinds of other health benefits. I wonder what 30 minutes of praying, reading the Bible, spending time with God, and practicing godliness in your interactions with other people might do for your spiritual health as well. See, I don't believe godliness will ever become an Olympic event. But it certainly should be a Christian one. Paul said to young Timothy, train yourself in godliness. The grandstands may be full. The pews may be full. Or they may be empty. But the audience of one, he's still watching. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.